Welcome information security enthusiasts. Today, we will be diving into an exciting and often overlooked topic in information security blogs and videos, offensive security with a focus on turnstiles used in physical access control systems. Throughout this series, we plan to share project details and provide insights from internal Proud to be Pride presentations. In this chapter, we will dedicate the next few minutes to an immersion in facial recognition aspects and the physical security of turnstiles. In the upcoming chapters, we will cover topics such as the use of implants for replay attacks, access to the logical network through turnstiles, and attacks on turnstile management software. Turnstiles are found in a variety of locations, from corporate buildings to subway stations. In many cases, access is controlled through cards, badges, facial biometrics, fingerprints, among others. Turnstiles play a crucial role in physical security, determining who is allowed to enter a specific location. When considering physical penetration testing, turnstiles play a crucial role in access control. The idea of physical penetration testing is to assess how easy or difficult it is for an unauthorized individual to gain access to the facilities. To achieve this, various techniques are used to determine the physical vulnerabilities in the environment and how they can be exploited. Let's delve into the details of a test conducted by Pride Security involving Wolpax turnstiles. These turnstiles are common in corporate environments, and the client wanted to modernize the company's access control during the COVID-19 pandemic. The upgrade included a module from ZKTCO, which introduced facial recognition features, even when the user was wearing a mask, and the ability to measure a person's temperature. With this system, employees could be granted access after facial recognition, provided their temperature was within the appropriate limits. It's important to highlight that the vulnerabilities we explored are not specific to this turnstile and therefore can also be applied to many other access control systems used in residential and commercial buildings. When analyzing this type of access control mechanism, there are two approaches to user authentication. The first is local authentication, suitable for smaller environments, such as small residential buildings, where only residents have access permission and all information is contained within the recognition module itself. In a corporate context, the most common practice is information centralization. In this scenario, various devices, such as badge readers, biometrics, and others are employed, with all data being transmitted and managed centrally. In this analysis, we will explore aspects related to security, starting with physical security, then moving on to the authentication mechanisms and protocols in use, and finally, we will investigate vulnerabilities in the management software. As mentioned earlier, it is a common practice in the corporate environment to centralize this information and manage it through specific software. Let's begin by examining the facial recognition mechanism used. Before we proceed, it's relevant to highlight that the client had informed us that the supplier had assured the performance of numerous tests on this device with the objective of ensuring the presence of effective security mechanisms to prevent attacks, such as the reuse of photos, videos, and other possible attack vectors. Given this assertion, one of our initial priorities was to verify the effectiveness of these mechanisms. We initiated the process by monitoring employee entries and exits at the company. Our aim was to capture a series of photographs of various employees, varying distances and angles, without of course attracting their attention. The intention was to use these photographs in the turnstile evasion process. When capturing these pictures, some important points to consider are 1. The need for high-resolution photos, as the influence of resolution on facial biometric identification was unknown. 2. Conducting tests with various types of paper to identify the most suitable for this approach. And 3. The importance of ensuring that the prints are life-size, meaning on sheets where the person's head size closely resembled reality. For a better understanding, let's analyze a real video of this project. In this scenario, we present the turnstile and the captured image of an employee who will serve as an example. It can be noted that we added a facial mask to the printed face of the employee. As mentioned, the turnstile allows recognition of the employee even while wearing a mask. We used suitable paper and printed in high quality. The key to deceiving the system is to identify the appropriate angle and position the photo correctly, allowing the turnstile to read it and, as a result, grant access. 
As demonstrated, access was granted. In this type of attack, three factors are crucial. In addition to considerations related to the quality of the photo and printing on appropriate paper, there was a very important aspect, the positioning. It was essential to position the paper at an appropriate angle to ensure recognition by the turnstile. Otherwise, we could have tried for a long time without any success. Distance and angle were very important. Another important point involved temperature reading. As mentioned, this turnstile could measure temperature. For example, if facial recognition was successful but the user had a fever, their access could be denied or their manager could be informed. Therefore, in addition to ensuring the proper position, correct distance and proper angle, another factor was to ensure that the turnstile could measure the temperature of the attacker adequately, thus allowing access. Finally, a relevant point was related to the algorithm's vulnerability when using a mask. As observed, we placed a real mask in front of the person's photo in the video, which significantly facilitated the authentication process. Without the mask, the recognition algorithm became considerably more robust. However, when using the mask, there were fewer facial reference points, allowing evasion. Additionally, we explored a variation of this attack, where we used photos found on social networks. This means that an attacker does not need to monitor the entry and exit of employees, avoiding unnecessary exposure in certain situations. Furthermore, we wanted to validate the relevance of photo quality. After all, on social networks, the quality of images is generally not as good. Initially, our approach involved searching for employees on LinkedIn, for example, individuals who work for this company. We used Pride Security's LinkedIn as an example to maintain the confidentiality of the hiring company. After locating the employees working for the client, our next step was to track their accounts on other social networking platforms, such as Facebook and Instagram. Once we found a photo that we believed that had an acceptable angle and image quality, we proceeded with the execution of the attack. As we can see in the video, we presented a social network profile of one of these employees, locating a photo that we believed had the appropriate quality and angle. However, the individual was accompanied by a child, which led us to blur the image on the phone. We then printed the photo in high resolution on suitable paper, like the previous video. It's worth noting that we applied a paint to simulate a mask over the mouth to test the facial recognition's robustness. This mask was painted with a pen commonly used in everyday life. To our surprise, the system recognized the identity in the same way. It's important to emphasize that other factors, such as temperature analysis, were also considered. Just out of curiosity, we positioned the photo at an angle where the camera read the face, while the sensor, located above on the turnstile, was able to read the attacker's forehead's temperature instead of the paper. In this way, we were able to demonstrate that the facial recognition algorithm is not robust, especially when people wear masks or use photos with painted masks. As previously mentioned, this attack is not exclusive to turnstiles. Does the company you work for have doors controlled with facial recognition that protects sensitive information? How secure are these mechanisms? Our goal is just to illustrate and explain the attack. In real cases, the attack can be carried out more discreetly, such as printing out the person's photo and sticking it to a book that you carry in your hands, or printing the person's photo on the t-shirt you are wearing. The sky's the limit. Can you carry out one of these attacks discreetly in real life? Send a video to Pride Security demonstrating your successful attack discreetly and win an exclusive Pride's t-shirt and be part of our next video. Yes, we will put your video in the next edition if you agree. No need to say that you must have authorization to carry out the attack, so do not expect cigarette packets to be delivered to anyone who gets arrested. So far, we've discussed attacks on facial recognition mechanisms. However, when examining the turnstile shown in the videos, we noticed that there is a badge reader's device. Usually, this badge reader module is attached with glue, and its removal is simple, as shown in the image. Once it is removed, we gain access to the wiring and various components inside the turnstile that may be of interest to an attacker. For example, this could allow the insertion of an implant, which in this case would be difficult to detect since it is not externally exposed. When we address the issue of unauthorized external access to the card reader's module, we enter the realm of physical security. It's worth noting that the turnstile is fitted with a lock to restrict access to its internal parts. Therefore, in addition to controlling access to specific areas within the company, the turnstile also has its own layer of physical security. This is an area of concern because a failure in this mechanism could permit a series of attacks. 
let's analyze how we can attack this layer of security that restricts access to the internal area of the turnstile. One of the methods we use to open this turnstile without authorization is known as bump attack or lock bumping. This type of attack is quite effective on a wide range of locks that use pins. We used keys called bump keys for this type of attack, as shown in the video. Here are some examples of those keys. Let's understand how this type of lock works. When we take the correct key for the lock, we can see that they have teeth. These teeth, when inserted into the cylinder, align the pins, as shown in the animation. When the teeth have the correct size, the key goes into the lock, and then the pins are moved in the right position, allowing us to rotate the cylinder, for example, opening or closing the lock. The bump key is nothing more than a key following the same standard as the lock we are attacking. The difference is that it has cuts at the minimum level allowed by the standard, meaning it has teeth at the lowest allowable height. The distance between the teeth is maintained according to the standard. The principle of the bump key is that it goes into the lock but does not correctly align the pins due to the teeth being at the minimum height. In other words, these teeth are shorter and do not create the necessary contact to align the lock's pins correctly. However, when hitting the key, this impact causes the pins to move and for a fraction of a second, they can align inside the cylinder, allowing the lock to open. Let's watch a video that will make understanding easier. Here, we have the Woolpack's turnstile. The customer is using the original key to open it, to demonstrate that the lock is working properly. What we find inside is interesting. We can identify ethernet cables and other data wires. The customer locks the turnstile and we show a homemade bump key. The key below is the bump key or 999 key. Additionally, we use a bump ring. This is not essential, but speeds up the attack, eliminating the need to reset the key frequently during the process. At this point, the customer tries to open the lock with the bump key. As you can see, it was not possible, meaning it is not a valid key for this lock. Now let's observe the attack in action. We are using a small hammer to create an impact on the key. As we can observe, the process of opening the lock with the bump key is very fast. These attacks are very interesting and swift. However, they are somewhat noisy, which, depending on the environment, can attract unwanted attention, and this makes the option unfeasible in some, if not most, cases. So, we might wonder how one can open the same lock without making a noise. We have observed a security design problem in this turnstile. Let's analyze this problem in detail. As mentioned earlier, we have the turnstile responsible for physical access control, which has a security design issue. First, let's understand how it works. As you can see, with the original key, we are unlocking it. On the door, there is a kind of latch that is fastened by a hook, which is located on the inside of the turnstile. When we insert the appropriate key and turn the cylinder, it moves an iron bar responsible for shifting the hook that locks the door, either up or down, allowing the door to be closed or opened. We can see that this lever that locks the mechanism is located exactly on the door's junction, presenting a small opening that provides access to this lever when the door is closed. Let's close it for a better view. As you can see, there is a small opening. By inserting a thin, solid object, it is possible to manipulate this lever and open the door without authorization in an extremely fast and silent manner, as demonstrated in the video. Today, we have explored the security of an important device present in our daily lives, but often underestimated, the turnstile. We have identified vulnerabilities in the facial biometric system, exploring techniques used by attackers to bypass these mechanisms and gain unauthorized access to physical environments. We have also observed that a turnstile has its own layer of physical security to restrict access to its internal environment, illustrated lock bumping attacks, and a security design issue that facilitates its opening. In the next episode, we will dive deeper, exploring the operation of implants and replay attacks. The journey into turnstile security continues. Stay tuned.